Hi everyone, my name is Mariam Zaidi. I am the programmer for South Asian films at the Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to National Bank, first of all, for sponsoring this screening of A Rifle in a Bag. We really hope you enjoyed the film. I'm so, so lucky to be here with the three directors and producers of the film, Arya Rote, Christina Haynes, and Isabella Rinaldi of No Cut Film Collective. Welcome, everyone, to Relation. Um, a quick reminder to everyone that's um, watching live, if you can send your questions through the CineSend chat. And then if you're on a phone, you'll see that the chat is at the bottom of your screen. So uh, to get us started, I'd love to ask all three of you um, just how you met, how you first met Somi. Uh, how did you first decide to make this film about her life? And, and what was that first conversation like with her when you, when you knew you wanted to work on this project? Who wants to start? <laughs> I start? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the three of us, we met in, uh, in a program, in a documentary directing program uh, that is a master course set, I mean, happening in Europe in three different countries that is called Doc Nomads. And the three of us, we studied together for two years. Uh, after that experience, which was pretty intense, uh, we decided we wanted to continue working together and we found the NOCAT Collective. And as a first thing, uh, Christina and I uh, went to India to see Arya and to maybe start researching for a film. After like uh, two, three months of very intense research, we, let's say, jumped from one film to another in the span of like few weeks, but we were never convinced. We found many stories, we were triggered by many uh, people, by many topics, but nothing felt like particularly right, and so we were constantly looking for the right story to tell. Um, we ended up in the area where we filmed, which is in central India, thanks to Arya's very close family friend, who is a doctor in that region, and is also in the film, by the way. Uh, once we got there, staying with him and visiting the area, we came across uh, this uh, surrendered Naxalite settlement, and we were quite curious and quite driven into understanding what was the issue there because we knew a little bit about the Naxalite issue, which in India is quite big, but we were quite impressed by the fact that these people who left the movement found a place for themselves and gathered together to, to kind of start their life again. So we started to meeting some of them, and there we met Somi, and she really stand out from everyone else, and... Uh, we told ourselves, like, I mean, the three of us, we kind of immediately agreed that if we were going to make a film about that, it was going to be to tell her story and through her. We wouldn't have done it otherwise. And uh, we, got, we went back like seven, eight months after, and we started filming. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I have so many questions about Somi and, and filming with her and her family, but... I mean, just coming back to, to filming as a collective, I'm, I'm really curious to know for the three of you, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a rare sort of setup for documentary filmmaking or any, any kind of filmmaking really, and really curious to know how, um, how that came about, how you decided to, to form the collective and also maybe talk a little bit about um, just making some creative choices. Cause I think working in a filmmaking team you can split the work somehow, but I, I'm just so curious to know, like specifically splitting creative decisions, um, how as, as all three of you directed and produced the films, did you make certain creative choices in production and then also um, in post-production because so much of a documentary is made in, in the edit room? Um, okay, I can start. So as Isabella was saying, uh, we met in this very special program uh, called Doc Nomads. Uh, that focuses on uh, documentary directing and uh, in there um, uh, international students uh, work together in countries uh, that are foreign to them they don't speak the language they uh, don't know most of the times anything about the culture um, of the country in which we were studying so it was for sure that uh, uh, this experience in Doc Nomads uh, gave us the courage uh, to work uh, in this uh, 
set up in this international, <coughs> transnational, transnational, uh, transcultural manner. Um, and it was also our uh, desire to work uh, independently as documentary filmmakers um, and to, um, yeah, to have the um, creative choices, uh, to have the creative choices uh, made by us and not to be restricted in any way uh, regarding the uh, artistic, uh, uh, all the artistic uh, decisions. So it was uh, this that uh, inspired us uh, to work in this way. And uh, when we mean collective, we mean um, uh, author collective. So uh, from the beginning, it started as a, uh, as an exploration of uh, sharing all the roles uh, that. Uh, exist in the filmmaking process. So from the research to the post-production, uh, the three of us were involved in uh, all the aspects. Uh, and this involvement was uh, total in the sense that it was never something that only I could do or only Isabella or only Aria. Uh, we would discuss it and uh, every little detail was up to discussion. Mm -hmm. So this is what we uh, mean by collective working. Uh, but uh, at the same time, while we were filming, we had to be effective and to keep some sort of uh, coherence. Uh, so in the filming stage, we did uh, split the roles. And um, Arya, being from uh, India, uh, she dealt with the communication with the characters. I was dealing with the camera and Isabella was recording the sound. Uh, but all the decisions were spoken before, uh, um, before we were going uh, uh, to the location and afterwards, obviously. So all the discussions would happen in the in-between. And then in the shooting phase, uh, we would be splitting these uh, so-called roles. Yeah. Yeah, if you can maybe also just talk about like, in terms of the creative decisions, uh, your decision to sort of film this in an observational style, you know, there's, uh, you met Somi and, and you learned of her story and, and it was very powerful for you to capture, but maybe a little bit about um, what was it about your influences or work that you that you watched and loved and, and studied that brought you to this particular style of filmmaking um, and this choice to just sort of be there for I mean, we can see how long you've been there because the kids are growing up in front of our eyes. So you, you spent a long time there and it's, 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 it's the heart of observational film is just staying and, and um, filming for a long time and just you know being there. Um, and you can also tell with the relationship that you have with the family and how, how much access and intimacy you have with them. So maybe talk a little bit about that style and, and what brought you to that decision. Um. I, I think it almost came to us naturally because uh, we were kind of, um, because even though I could communicate with the characters when they were interacting amongst themselves, they were using the tribal languages, which is Gondia and Madia. So none of us actually knew uh, when we were filming what was being filmed to wow. its detail. So uh, that was one of the reason. And the other thing is, I think for all the three of us, from our school days, kind of our inclination is towards observational uh, cinema because for the reasons that you just said that you can spend a lot of time and you can actually in depth understand the life and the stories of the characters and what they also want to say when they want to talk about their stories, which is a very important element for us. So. Um, it, like I, I don't think the effort was to be invisible with the camera, but it was more to be comfortably visible with them. And then observational just became that mode with which we could uh, make it happen. So I think that was the reason why we chose to do it. Right. And then just also just coming back to the to the length of the film, as I as I mentioned, like we just we see the the kids growing up, we see them sort of go through. You know, he um, Somi's first child first is able to go to school, and then eventually has has trouble going back. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of like the amount of time you spent. 
um, with the family? Was there, like, did you break in between and sort of work on what you were filming, at, you know, to look at your footage? Um, because I, I, as Arya mentioned, there was um, a, a bit of a language barrier at some points. Um, and then did you sort of like, what, what during the course of filming and during this like very long period that you spent with the family, um, how much of it was sort of um, just being there and how much of it was sort of asking them to sort of have certain conversations or to go to certain places or um, that sort of sort of encouragement of scenes perhaps? Uh, yeah, we spent, we filmed uh, over the course of uh, three years. I mean, totally, I mean the film because we met them at the beginning of 2017 and we finished filming at the beginning of 2020 um to, no 2020 we premiered anyway, we over the course of three years but so 2017 2019 we finished filming and 2020 we premiered sorry uh so in total like we were coming and going and we, but we would go for like uh, large chunks of time to film with them. So like the first time we spent almost two months with them, which clearly brought us to have a lot of days in which we were not filming, but we were just hanging out with the characters, knowing them, allowing them to know us. So yeah, that's also what granted us like to show this large evolution of time because we, and we would mainly film during the winter meaning mm -hmm. like from let's say October to January uh, because it is climate wise it was the best way the best time when to film because otherwise it, there was the rainy season and or the summer which is incredibly hot there and also their life a lot of most of the things happens in that season anyway uh, Aria went once without us because the baby was about to be born and so that was something that we wanted to at least the first few weeks and months of the baby we wanted to capture uh, but yeah, we did spend a lot of time with, just, with them just to know them and to gain mutual trust, which is also, I think, something, I mean, not, not only crucial for us and for the way we like to film and to interact with characters, it is, it is also something crucial for the storytelling and for the structure of the film, because as you mentioned, obviously we would come back, figure out what we had in the footage, discover some of the things, obviously, because we couldn't really understand their dialogue in details and uh, and so that also helped us to think about the film to know them better and to at times trigger some of the events or at least facilitate what we knew was going to happen and obviously like having to having as much as we had time and we were free because again we were the producer so we could really do whatever we wanted but we didn't have all the time in the world so we knew that something might have happened and at times we tried to kind of made it happen while we were there. Uh, but it was quite easy and quite fluid and we could reach that because we spent a lot of time with them. And so it was easy for us to predict or to understand as much as it was easy for them to communicate with us and exchange ideas and thoughts. And because a lot of things, I mean, we really made the film, all the characters, have an incredible weight in the making of this film but really with Somi we really made the film with her because a lot of times she since the beginning we wanted to be sure that she understood what kind of pro let's say project we were doing and what kind of process we were going through together and she understood it immediately we managed to communicate this well and many times she was the one coming to us with ideas saying maybe this is something that could be good for the film mm. or this is something I care for. And then together we would find a way to to make it in place and to see if, uh, if it would work. Right. Um, <clears throat> just coming back to sort of communicating with, with Somi and her family, I'm wondering um, what, so how did you work around sort of like, I, I'm assuming there were some, some language barriers with either some, some dialects at least um, and how you sort of, in the moment were able to know to, to continue filming or to, you know, if, if how much did you know of conversations? Because sometimes you can get the gist of, of what people are saying, um, but how much of that was possible right away? And then, um, and then how did that kind of work in the edit? Were there scenes that you were surprised by that you 
maybe guessed the content of and then later realize it has more weight or less weight than maybe you assigned it at first. Um, and since we're going in this like very natural little cycle, I'll start with maybe Arya. Uh, so I spoke with Somi in Hindi. Okay. So we had a common language between us, but uh, like we were saying that once it was rolling, maybe I understood a couple of words. But uh, as Isa and Christina were saying earlier, that we are used to a setup like this, that we don't understand the language, but there are always expressions. There is the body language. There is how a conversation goes, that if you, you know that there is something interesting here, of course, there was a long process of getting it translated and then translating it to English for us to understand each and every line. But uh, they, and I, I would say there were some really nice surprises that we would think that, OK, this is a nice scene. But then you actually understand what's being spoken. And we were completely blown away. We were like, wow, this is way better than what we could have uh, imagined it to be. Did but one that of those Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, did one of those scenes make it into the film? A scene that, that surprised you that... Yeah, actually, the scene where uh, Somi speaks to Dadu by the riverside, yes. talking about her uh, past. So we knew she was going to talk about her past, but we had no idea how it would play out because it was the thing she was also doing for the first time. And it took her a while to get to that decision to tell him her story. So uh, when we saw it actually completely translated, I think we were we were just completely taken by that scene. Like we knew there that this is it, like we need to have this. So we were kind of hoping it would be nice, but I think for all the three of us, it was way more than what any one of us could have imagined it to be. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's truly, I mean, any for anyone watching, that's truly one of the scenes where you're like, you know, you get a sense of, of Somi and her fearlessness and her um, her character and her relationships and her as a mother, but in that scene is really where you know you you get to the heart of who she is. Although you you've been building that for a while, and and we really get to know her as a person. But in that scene, the, even just the way that she talks to her son and and what she says is so profound and and really. Um, yeah, just really brings her character to a whole new level, I think. So congratulations on on being able to establish that that relationship and that and that uh, you know bring that scene to life that that was really so profound. Um, Thank you. And I, yeah, and I think one of the things that you also leave with this film is this sort of anger of you know the family being neither here nor there, like they're sort of you know. The, um, Somi's husband's not able to go back to Chhattisgarh. Um, he, the sons, you know, they're not able to get the certificates or documents that they need, but they're also really nostalgic of this past life and, and speak of it with so much pride. So there's this like sort of feeling of limbo and, and feeling of, of, of frustration and, you know, just disillusionment, I guess, with the system. Um, and you capture that so beautifully in Somi's character because she, you know, talks of the future so much. She talks about her son and, and education and jobs, um, but then she also talks of the past with, you know, her parents and um, just in general, it, it comes up in conversation so much with, you know, just that scene with, with her son at the water. Did you always kind of have this sense from Somi right at the beginning that, um, that she'd be that she was you know that her character would eventually in the film evolve to be this represent that sort of state of like limbo or a state of um just this, this frustration with this did you always know that her character would kind of bring that out or was that something that sort of developed over time how much did you know that she would be able to like build the film in this way um maybe we'll start with christina again since we've been working in the cycle <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, um, well, actually, uh, we noticed uh, from a conversation we had with Somi at the very beginning um, of our uh, uh, shooting that she was um, torn in between. Um, it was quite evident from the beginning uh, because we, I mean, it wasn't there obvious in a normal conversation, but we had an in-depth conversation with her about her past. And it was then, uh, after we translated again, that we saw that uh, she sometimes was 
not very sure on which side she was currently on. She was uh, pendulating between the Maxillites and uh, uh, let's say the civilian status she was in right now. And this was an indication for us that, uh, yeah, most probably, um, this, I mean, it was clear for us this is a very strong uh, feature of hers that needs to be mm -hmm. hidden uh, because it meant she had to give up uh, ideas, her ideas, uh, in order to, to work for the future of her family. And um, it was, um, it was something we were looking for to bring it in the film mm -hmm. because this would uh yeah it, we tried uh from the beginning not to uh give to the next right movement a sort of uh, romanticized um, allure um because uh, it's quite easy to um, get into that temptation sometimes especially coming from outside and uh, just understanding what their uh, intentions are and how this uh, movement portrays itself and the, uh, the ideology that uh, uh, they uh, enforce. Um, so we, we like very much that Somni could have a critical view on her past. And that was the most uh, important thing to think in the film concerning her past. If anyone else has more to add to that, Isabella, Arya, in terms of Somi's character, feel free. Um, I mean, I agree with Christina that we, it's something that we notice immediately. And as she said, like this critical view that she had, it was really something, it was something that you could, I don't know, at least we felt it, I felt it, we perceived it since the beginning. But then the more we talked to her, the more we know her, knew her, it, it was quite, I mean, it's always impressive to see someone that has joined a cause that requires so much, in a way, trust and devotion, like the next slide. And at the same time, you can see that they are still uh, binded to it. They still feel connected to it, but at the same time, they're able to criticize it and think it critically it's something that i think it's crucial in in, the, in an individual and it's sometimes very rare to find especially in these sorts of um, in these collective experiences regardless okay this is a very extreme one obviously i mean it's a guerrilla movement so i wouldn't compare it to like a political movement like per se but like it's usually very rare when people join a collective cause you can see the tendency to be in a way blinded or to just want it to be part of it while she had both like she had the belief and the pride of her belief because she's still she's still very very into that in that sense but at the same time she had the clarity of mind to think as an individual and to see what was not working and to try to make it work and then eventually she had to give up in a way and you could see that she was she, she's still suffering that she had to give up to her belief so that was something that i i mean it was it was evident in the beginning but at least for me it was like it piled up so much and it became so much more intense and deeper mm -hmm. and relatable i would say that it was definitely eventually while we were finishing the film and editing the film we really understood that that was one of the main point of it like it is the limbo, it is uh, the, the the future of the children, but it's also her having mm -hmm. to struggle with her, these two sides of her, which are both absolutely strong and powerful and uh, and right in a way, because she she is right in both sides, but they are in a way contradictory, and that's like I think it's something that everyone can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe Arya, I'll also ask you to add to that if you'd like, and then. Um, I'm just also curious to know um, if Somi seen the film and what her sort of reaction was to seeing herself and her story because you, you talk about working with her on this film and how she approached you for certain moments and scenes to capture. So so when she finally saw it, um, what her reaction was was to her own life story. 
So, uh, like uh, Isabel and Christina said, I agree with them, and I, I think also, particularly her spirit stood out against many in the settlement because the disillusionment that they faced put them, at least some of them that we saw, in a state of uh, complete idleness that they were not willing to take more efforts or they were completely bogged down by their situation. And Somi still has a fight in her, which for us was amazing every time that she, she even in the film, you can see that she has a, um, she has an amazing way of converting her pain into laughter and she does it. And I, I, I think that is a very unique thing that I, I had not witnessed it anywhere. So uh, that is one thing. And yeah, Somi was the first person to watch the film. And the moment we finished the edit, uh, we went to her and we showed her the film and she liked it a lot. And we speak to her from time to time. So she's also updated on all the things that are happening uh, with the film. And she liked it very much. Uh, she felt that what mattered to her was being a mother first than a surrendered Naxalite. And she felt that the film portrays her more as a mother. So she really liked that. And uh, she told us that it's a story. Uh, there are many mothers like her around her. And uh, for her, she was just one of them. She was kind of a representative. So she thought that with this story, maybe uh, whoever is watching can understand that there are many people and many mothers like her who are going through a similar kind of a situation and then the film could reach its potential in a way for her. That's amazing. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll start with this one. It's a really great question. Um, the observational approach has its criticisms, chiefly that it doesn't always provide a lot of context. Um, how did you feel about choosing this creative aesthetic choice, especially when the context of the film and the characters' lives is so politically charged in the contemporary moment? We'll start with you, Christina, so we can go in our <laughs> little round. Uh, yeah, the context uh, issue was there from the beginning. We struggled very much uh, in realizing uh, how much uh, we should explain the Naxalite movement in the film, uh, how much we can leave aside and still be understood, uh, how yeah, uh, which universal things we can bring that can uh, that don't need so much uh, specific details to be understood. So um, we we understood after seeing uh, some of the conversations our characters are uh, were having in the scenes uh, that the next slide movement. Um, in front of our eyes as we were watching the footage, as we also didn't have a, a first-hand experience of it, was being um, outlined like very mysteriously, of course. And we wanted to leave this in the film and to uh, allow the audience to fill in some blanks to fill in uh, the backstory of the characters, but still, of course, give some anchors so you could start that imagination process. So we even sometimes um, illustrated some stories uh, visually in order to, to, I don't know, to think forward a more eternal space to, to take you uh, elsewhere while these stories were unfolding. Um, so we did of course, trigger some conversations because uh, we were afraid that the context would be uh, too vague in the film. And some of them remained and they were needed. But um, in the end, we realized that we didn't need so much as we thought at the beginning. Right. Um, and then another question is, um, again, about the observational style of filmmaking, which requires a lot of discipline. Um, so what were some places where that distance broke down and how strident were you in the edit to stick to that style? 
So maybe a little bit about your post-production process and, and what it was like constructing those scenes and, and sticking to that whole um, sort of, you know, just that, that feeling that you have with observational film of really just being there with people um, in, their, in their most intimate moments. Isabella, maybe we'll go to you next. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it does require a lot of discipline. It's true, and sometimes it it is perceived like as a forced thing on a film. I believe that like uh, it makes sense. I mean, it's it's definitely something we like, obviously. But I believe that you should know who is your character and how is the relationship with you and with the camera. Like, I don't think it's something that can happen for any film. I don't think it's something that should be forced on a film. In our case, uh, I mean, the question asks, so where the distance broke down? I wouldn't say that there was any distance ever. Like, the camera is very much present and the, it's the interaction between the camera and the character in the moment in which we're filming that at times makes it uh, valuable. I mean, that makes it valuable for me at least. And uh, it was not hard for us to stick to the style because of the language barrier that we had while we were filming, because we didn't want our characters to speak another language, because they, we could have asked them to speak in Hindi, but that would have been incredibly weird for them. So speaking their own language while we were filming did create like a sort of bubble in which they would feel somehow protected, even though we were very present and we were there with them. Uh, so I would say that in the post-production we didn't have to do, in the edit, we didn't do much to stick to the style because we filmed like very intentionally and uh, again Somi is such a potent figure and is such a potent character that was also able to lead the others while we were filming so there, there, are, no, there are no moments, also as you can see we have very, very long takes which is the other tool that we use to convey their words and their thoughts as truly and as genuinely as possible. So there were, let's say, because I don't know if the question is asking like were there any moments in which you had to kind of fake it that it was observational or something, we didn't have much this I would say because we were very also precise in filming, we didn't film like uh, anything that was happening in front of us so there were a lot of moments i mean we knew we established with them a situation in which once we film that's how it goes mm -hmm. so i would say that uh, it, it does require a lot of discipline it requires a lot of time like i mean there are scenes in which maybe there are three minutes on the film and the entire scene is 50 so yes uh but yeah i would say that with the i don't know with the right storytelling and with the right character personality it's it's doable i would say and then you don't have to force it in the edit in a way if i interpret the question correctly i think so yeah um <clears throat> just coming back to the first audience question which was about um the characters lives um being you know in this contemporary moment that is so politically charged um maybe i'll ask you next aria just I guess that question makes me think a lot about another scene that is so powerful in the film, which is um, the scene of Somi's son in school. And so, you know, there's the, um, a classroom full of children, including her son, um, are learning these, you know, very nationalist chants. And, um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that particular scene, um, filming it, what, was that kind of what you expected when, you know, was it just to film her son in school and sort of show this, because it just shows that distance between, you know, Somi's influences in life and her sort of way of thinking and then what potentially her son might be absorbing. Um, so yeah, if you can just talk a little bit about filming that scene and then also what how that came about. So, uh... I don't think the song scene was intentional or planned by any one of us, but we are really glad it happened because I think it kind of summarized what we were feeling with uh, Dadu there because uh, we had gone to visit him at school and to film how his life is happening there. And uh, it was the first time that he was away from his parents and he knew us, of course, but you could still very visibly see how displaced he was. That, and then it makes you wonder that should a 
like is this what you call education should a kid be going through this so what he had versus what he has now the language barrier the cultural barrier everything that she's dreaming for this is kind of uh, where it is and that put us us also in a very gray space that even though it's the happy ending let's say that the kid goes to the school what exactly is this school and what exactly is this education and how there there is a strong undertone of propaganda also in the song that is that just like it was another one of those magical documentary moments for us that happened there that this song is being taught and all the kids want to be soldiers and it kind of connected that scene in many different ways considering somi is also a kind of a soldier so yeah it uh, i think it were a very different few days that we spent in the school trying to absorb this but i think filming in the school was also for us uh, of, of i mean for us also it was as new as probably it was for dadu living right. there that's amazing i mean it's it's so interesting to hear there's so many um things that kind of you didn't know to expect and and they they went above and beyond your expectations of what a scene could hold and then other decisions that were very intentional so uh maybe just talking a little bit about some of the intentional decisions and 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 some of the things i guess i mean all decisions were intentional but i guess some of the things that um you were able to control a little bit more um than than knowing what a scene would hold potentially um just you know one of the things i noticed was whenever somi goes to sort of get her um you know get get more on her the status of her documents or or to the school um to to even to the to the clinic or anything like that um there was this intentional sort of um focus on on her and her family and not on the officials in the film um so you know there's this one particular scene but there's actually very many but one that i remember where it's that just them sitting on on some chairs and they're barely speaking it's more mostly the officials that are speaking but you 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 chose to keep the camera on them and i found those choices really interesting and i was wondering if you could talk about that kind of framing and that choice christina maybe you next Yeah. Um, well, yeah. With that uh, choice, we wanted to emphasize that uh, the all the issues that they are facing are systemic and not necessarily connected to uh, one office or another, one governmental official or another one. Uh, because actually, the ones that we met and the ones that work in that region that is um inhabited by uh, many uh, belonging to the indigenous community um they they know their issue um they are some are trying to be helpful like we met some some are not really that helpful uh but we didn't want to put this emphasis uh, on the on the person that you would say then represents the government because that would have been uh, of course the uh, next thought uh, the uh, showing them would have triggered uh, so then we wanted very much to focus on the reaction that Sony is having and um, to yeah to understand uh, how to like it was yeah a sort of a observation and exploration of that moment to understand how Somi would react uh, and how she would respond in these meetings and she was sometimes feeling defeated otherwise she would talk back so uh, we wanted to uh, observe that yeah i think that that definitely comes across so much because there's this choice where you're filming her while she's speaking and and active in the film but then there's these moments where she's not as much and and it really it just you know emulates this feeling of obviously being there with her but also just you know observing her reactions and her facial expressions and just the energy of the moment which i think gets communicated so beautifully and and throughout the film really um so i think we'll we'll kind of close 
for today, but I, I mean, I have so many questions and could continue talking to you for, for a very long time. Um, but I think maybe the last thing that I'd love to ask all of you, I mean, we'd love to see your future films at the festival. Um, so maybe talk to us a little bit about what you have coming up, what you're working on, um, all of you, your projects and, and kind of what's in the works right now. I'm sure, you know, as with most filmmakers around the world, it's their uh, layer challenges and in, in putting together work right now. But if there's something that you're working on, um, tell us a little bit about it. Okay, yeah. Can say. So yeah, I mean, we are a little bit uh, like stuck, like everyone. And I mean, even though we are used to work long distance, now it's step ahead of challenging. Uh, with no cut, I mean, we we are also producing other filmmakers film, co-producing. So at the moment we are working on, as no cut, we are working on two films, one to do mentors, one in India and uh, one in Nepal. Uh, so that's the thing that we are doing right away and also taking care of a rifle and a bag to accompany to the world because at least the film can travel a bit. And then, yeah, we have like ideas for other future films, which for now they're just a little bit in a bubble until we are able to actually go again out in the world. Uh, then, yeah, I would say like each one of us is also working on other things that are not under the no cut umbrella. But yeah, we are at the moment, no cut wise, is these two films that we are co producing. Amazing. Um, well, I just want to say such a huge thank you to all three of you for sharing your film with us, um, for being here for this conversation. It's It's been such an honor to, to screen the film and to speak to all three of you. And I, I really, really hope we get to see um, your future work at the festival again and, and stay in touch as well. Um, I want to thank Jamie um, from Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Services for their support today. Um, and to everyone watching, please remember that the festival is going on till November 19th and to get your tickets at relation.com um, and come check out the rest of the lineup. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.